I lied. I did lie. I was taking pills. I lied to Paw Paw, Ro Ro, Bus Bus, Toot Toot. I lied about being down there that night. I was taking pills. All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. I hope you're doing well. So, folks, today we're going to talk about Alec Murdoch taking the stand. It's a surreal moment seeing that guy up there after all these years of running around low country, thinking him and his family run the place. A big, fat, sweaty, lying, sleazeball, opiate, zombie, psychopath from hell, driving around with a fake badge hanging off his pocket. Like Jeremy DeWitt, for some reason he has blue lights installed in his vehicle. I'm taking pills. He took the stand late last week on Thursday and Friday. He was up there for about seven hours. But probably the biggest, oh my God, moment of the whole thing happened within the first minute or two of him taking the stand. And that was when Alec, for the first time in almost two years since his wife and son were found brutally murdered, Alec admitted that he actually was at the murder scene right when it happened. Okay, that's a pretty big difference then. I wasn't at the murder scene. You can't put me at the murder scene because I wasn't there. I was at my mom's. I have an airtight alibi. I was at my mom's. Ask the home health care nurse. She'll tell you I was there. I was nowhere near the scene. So there you go. And now here we are. A month into the trial, and Alec gets up on the stand and admits I was at the murder scene right when it happened. And the way from where I'm sitting, that's it. That's devastating. His whole case was I was not at the murder scene, and I have this alibi. The alibi always seemed a little bit too perfect and constructed, and Alec... Check the phone data. I made calls at the right times and I tore ass to my mom's place and I came back and found this horrible scene and I was not there. Check the alibi. Well now, once you admit that you were there right when it happened, that alibi is no longer an alibi. It's just a trip to your mom's. All right, you went to your mom's. Good for you. But it's no longer anything as far as defense for these murders goes. It's irrelevant. Now it's incriminating because after this horrible thing happened, you were right there within a couple minutes of it happening, and then all of a sudden you scuttled around your place like a weirdo and then tore ass to your mom's? What? I don't know. But let's go over why after almost two years of sticking with his story and multiple police interrogations, anytime his lawyers would do an interview, they would parrot the story. He was not there at that moment. He did not go to the dog kennels with M Maggie and Paul. He stayed at the house and then he went to the mo and then he went to his mom's house. He wasn't at the scene. You can't put him at the scene. Why would Alec admit at that moment? Well, kind of had to. And that's because months after the murders took place, a case-changing piece of evidence came off of Paul Murdoch's phone. If Alec did do this, which in my opinion he did, especially now that he admitted to being at the scene right when it happened, but if he did plan this, which it feels like he did, you could see how being a prosecutor, he could think in his mind, all right, if I was prosecuting this case, what would I look for? And so he could really make sure the cell phone data and the car electronic data and everything looked all right. Again, the alibi always looked a little bit too manufactured to me, but hey, it was what it was. So he can get the car data and he can get the his cell phone and he can text at this time and he can call at that time and try to make the whole thing look good but what he didn't have control over and what i don't think alex saw coming was his son paul taking a video which has been deemed the kennel video 
And once they, he took that on his phone, Alec couldn't get it off. So what's been deemed the kennel video is that fateful night back in June, uh, June 7th, 2021, Maggie and Paul and Alec, but the story was Maggie and Paul went down to the dog kennels. Alec was too hot after dinner. He wanted to stay home and then he tore ass to his mom's place. But there's a video that Paul took in the kennel where he's Rogan, the close family friend's dog, was at their kennel. And Paul first tried to call Rogan to talk about Rogan's dog's tail, which was having an issue. The, there was not enough cell phone reception to do the call or the FaceTime call. So Paul thought, all right, well, I'll take a video on Snapchat and then send it to Rogan. So Paul is taking this video inside of the kennel, showing the dog's tail, and you can hear Maggie in the background, and you can hear another voice in the background. That video wasn't pulled off of Maggie's, or off of Paul's phone, excuse me, until months after the murders. So Alec had his whole ducks in a row, right when he called... 911 that night it's bad you gotta come out here it's bad and then right when law enforcement got out there the first cop to get out there one of the first things that alex said to him was it's a long story there was a boat wreck and alec rarely tells the truth but when alec looked at that cop and said it's a long story it's like man you can say that again, Alec. My God, is it a long story. But already seconds, within the first couple seconds of seeing the first law enforcement on scene to your wife and son's brutal murder, you're already pushing the story in certain directions and molding the narrative. There was a boat accident. I know it was that. He was receiving threats. And then Alec does a little interrogation questioning in the car that night where he is adamant that he was not down at the kennels he was nowhere near the kennels he was long gone by the time it happens on the way to his mom's then he does another interrogation a couple days later and then a month later he does another interrogation and it's always i was not there I just, I don't know what to tell you. I was not there. Well, then months down the road, all of a sudden they pull off the kennel video. Well, there's three voices on the kennel video. And I would imagine that Alec and his lawyers are having late night stressful meetings going, how are we going to deal with that video? Alec's voice, it sounds like Alec's voice is on there. Maybe the jury won't think it's Alec's voice. I think maybe they thought, let's see how it plays in court. If everybody, if it comes off like, dang, that really is Alec's voice, then we'll have you get up on the stand and say you lied and we'll deal with it. Or maybe they always, once that video came out, maybe they, right when it came out, they thought, all right, we have to get up on the stand and deal with that chunk of evidence, which that really is the piece of evidence, in my opinion, of the whole case. So three weeks before Alec got up on the stand, the prosecution introduces the clip, the kennel video to the core, and they back it up with some really strong testimony from friends and family who say, I recognize Alec's voice as the third voice. How sure are you that that's Alex's voice? 100%. I'm positive. And so I think at that point, his lawyers and Alec were probably thinking, all right, well, we can't have Alec just sit behind the defense table and hoping the jury just goes, well, even though everybody recognizes that voice as Alex and it sounds like Alex's voice, since it doesn't show him, we can't be sure. Not guilty. You got to head off that piece of evidence at the pass. So three weeks after the infamous kennel video is introduced to the court with the supporting testimony, Alec takes the stand. The first thing his lawyer asks is, did you take a gun like this, this gun or a gun like this and blow your son's head off? And the reason he used such a graphic terminology blow your son's head off is 
Because they're about to admit that Alec was at the scene right when it happened, minutes from where it happened, and the alibi, which was their whole case, check the airtight alibi. Now that alibi is completely irrelevant. Now their whole case, which they won't admit, they'll, they're downplaying the whole thing, but from where I'm sitting, their entire case, once he admitted that he was at the murder scene, when it happened, was, or their whole case is, that it is totally absurd that this man would kill his family, right? That's why they use the term, did you take this gun and blow your son's head off? Saying to the jury, how crazy would it be for a nice father to kill his family? That's absurd. Even though the evidence doesn't support his innocence, come on. He calls his son Papa. That became the strategy. Call your son Paul, Papa, over and over and over, hoping that the jury will think he calls him Papa. There's no way he murdered his son Paul because he calls him Papa. That's an endearing nickname. Anybody that would call their son an endearing nickname wouldn't murder him. He calls him Papa. And so he says, did you take this gun or any gun like it and blow your son's head off? He goes, no, I would never hurt my son. And then the very second thing, they get into it. They say, is that you in the kennel videos? He goes, it is. And they said, did you lie to police and to everybody and say that you weren't there? I did. Well, why did you lie? And the reason that he puts forth that he lied about the most important thing you could possibly lie about in a murder investigation, which is, I was at the scene of the murder right when it happened. Three people were hanging out on a rural property in the middle of nowhere. Two of them got brutally murdered. And then the third one, the one that wasn't murdered, then started scuttling around like a weirdo, tore ass to the mom's place and started acting incredibly guilty. So how do you explain that, Alex? Why did you lie about such an important thing? And Alex said that he was having paranoid thoughts. The old paranoid thoughts. As my addiction got worse, I had paranoid thoughts. And it's like, Alec, those aren't paranoid thoughts. Those are normal thoughts. Thinking that law enforcement would, would think it was you that murdered your family if you admitted to them, I was right there. I was with them moments before. I think it was four minutes the video puts Alec at the scene four minutes before they think Maggie and Paul were murdered. Paul was always on his cell phone, and his cell phone never unlocked again after 8.49, and the video is at 8.45. And so it is devastating to the defense case. Alec's lawyers and Alex can downplay it all they want. I had paranoid thoughts. Just the old paranoid thoughts kicking in. I was on pills. I was taking pills. They can try to downplay it. And the strategy was, okay, come out there. Just say you were having paranoid thoughts. You got scared. You were high on pills. And then we're going to act like, okay, that was a lie. But everything else is he said is true. Okay, he lied about that. He was having paranoid thoughts. But other than that, all of the other events were true. He was telling the truth. The alibi at his mom still works. Doesn't really, but they're trying to say it still works if you really think about it. If you think about it, it still kind of works. And therefore, Alec is kind of a hero because he got up there and admitted the lie. It was tough to do. He was having paranoid thoughts from the peels and nothing to see here. So they quickly, which is another part of the strategy of direct um, examination, they quickly got out of the way at the very beginning. The big lie. All right. We discussed it. Now let's forget about it. Now let's talk about things like Alec's niece having a baby and things that make Alec look like a real person. So they get that out of the way real early. And then they say, all right, let's talk about six 
June 7th, 2021. And the most interesting part in both the direct examination and the cross-examination is when the lawyers say, let's talk about June 7th, 2021, the fateful night. And so Alex's new story was he gets home around 7, Paul gets home around the same time, they ride the property like two happy father and son. They go to the field. They go to the pond. They're having quality time together. At a certain point, Maggie gets home at the main house. They all go back to the main house for a little dinner. They eat dinner. During dinner, he said they talk about Paul's high blood pressure and how uh, nervous Maggie was about his feet swelling up. The 22-year-old was having high blood pressure already, probably because of the excessive drinking problem that Paul had. Alec never mentions that, but they're talking about the high blood pressure their 22-year-old kid has. And then Alec's story is that he was tired. He took a shower and didn't want to go back out in the heat. Maggie and Paul wanted to go out to the dog kennels and let the dogs run around. He didn't want to go. They left before he had to admit because of the darn kennel video that he didn't see coming. Dang it. He, my son took that video. Before that video, the story was I didn't feel like going. I wanted to lay on the couch. I took a little nap. I woke up. I called Maggie. I text Maggie to say I was going to my mother's to check on her. And then I went to check on my mother's. Once the video came out that he had to admit, damn it. Then he admitted that I was sitting on the couch and like a lot of things that I told I didn't want to do, but Maggie, my wife, wanted me to do, I decided, all right, I'm going to go do it. And so he went out to the kennels, and here's where the evidence, where he can't really lie about it. And so the evidence from the kennel video, you can hear Maggie say, hey, the dog has a bird in its mouth. It's a guinea. And you can hear Paul say, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a chicken. And then you hear Alec go, come here, Gus. Talk to the dog, trying to get the chicken out of the dog's mouth. And so Alec is forced to say up there, all I did when I got out there, I pulled up on the golf cart, slammed on the brakes. Hi, everybody. I'm out here just for a second. Oh, my gosh. The dog has a bird in his mouth. I took the bird out of the dog's mouth, set it on a crate, and was tired of being out there. It was way too hot, and I didn't want to be out there, and I was doing what I didn't want to do out there. So I said, see you later. He pulls up. Ah, the bird. All right. Got to go. Because for his story to make sense and for him not to go to jail for the rest of his life for murdering his wife and son... He has to make it sound realistic that he was back at the main house and gone within like a three minute period now, which is a total stretch to make sound real. So he's saying, I pulled up, slammed on the brakes, talked to Maggie. What'd you talk to Maggie about? Uh, I have no idea. Got the bird out of the dog's mouth. Gotta go. See you later. Tore ass back in the golf cart. Ah, ah, fast as the golf cart could go. Got to the house. For some reason, took 283 steps in this small amount of period. That's a scuttle. He was scuttling around like a guilty murderer. Scuttles around and then at that point, calls and texts his wife and pulls out of there to go to his mom's. But... And then is at his mom's for a little bit, was acting weird. The home health care nurse said, yeah, it's uncommon for him to come out there at that time. He was acting very fidgety and weird. He was only out there for like 15 or 20 minutes that she remembers. But for his story to sound real, he wanted it to seem like he was out there for 30 to 40. So when everything, the investigation is going, he went to the home health care nurse and said, remember, I was out there for 30 to 40 minutes. And she's going what? No, you weren't. And that conversation where Alec went to her and said, remember 30 to 40, that made her feel so uncomfortable and so weird that she called her brother and told her, told him about that interaction. Yeah, my Alec wants me to tell the police he was out there for 30 to 40 minutes and he's acting all weird. And, and then he comes back to the 
property, says he sits in the main house, tries to call Maggie, they don't answer, and then that's when he goes out there and uh, and finds them, and then the 911 call, and the show begins. His whole testimony was a total snot fest. This whole trial really has been a big old snot fest. Big giant snot streams hanging from his almost to the point where it's like, are you letting that snot hang just long enough so it can be caught on camera and people can notice? Man, he's really crying. He's really snotting it up over there, and it's hanging, and then he goes, oh, oh, and acts like, oh, I got it. Uh, And then a little bit later, (laughs) oh, whoops, whoops. It also comes off just like how often and many times he's calling Paul Papa. It seems like the snot hanging from his face is a strategy. Look, I'm crying. There's snot hanging. There's no way I did it. I'm calling my son Papa. There are times where he would call him Paul in his testimony and then correct himself with Papa, which is that's not really how nicknames work. Um, And then they end the direct examination by trying to shape it desperately. It's not easy. Like his finances were fine. He wasn't in a total financial free fall. There was equity in the house. (laughs) No, it's fine. His finances were good. They were good. He had equity in a few of the properties when in reality they could make an entire documentary series on how big of a financial free fall Alec Murdoch was in. Him stealing money from the clients, especially he had the Gloria Satterfield had this bizarre trip on their property. He, she tripped over the dogs and hit her head and there's no autopsy and... Nothing to see here. And then Alec, like a total sleazeball that he is, told her sons, I'm going to take care of you. You guys don't worry. Your mama died on our property. She tripped over our dogs. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to sue my insurance company. And he did sue his insurance company. And he got $4 million, but he did not give one single penny of it to her sons. It's unbelievable. So they try to make it sound like his finances were fine. (laughs) Come on. But that is a real stretch. Um, Tried to make it sound like the boating accident wasn't stressful. And all of the lawsuits that were raining down like an afternoon southern rainstorm, it wasn't too bad. I was... Alec was saying, I wasn't doing any of the lawyer work. I wasn't stressed out about it. It just, the boat accident wasn't the boat accident. And then they ended with the way they ended at the beginning. Did you kill your son? I never killed my son. I never, ever killed my wife or my son. So they bookended it with that. And then cross-examination. You know what? I think I'm going to cut it off and we will pick up cross-examination on the next video. I love you all. Why? Stive and why? Shamita. See you next time.